Montreal, good afternoon. Envoy 3940, 14-3 for uh, 11 at EBDOT. Airbus 3940, Montreal, Terminal, good day. Information, Kilo ILS, Envoy 24, right? All Terminal 2958. We'll get Kilo and we'll plan on the right side, Envoy 3940. Montreal Terminal, good evening, Aircana 318, 13, 3 to 6 to 8,000 with Kilo. Aircana 318, Terminal, bonjour, landing on 24 right, the Alphamon is 2958, proceed now direct to Max Sad. Max Sad, Aircana 318. Descendez 4 minutes. Descendez 4 minutes, Aircana 2958. Roger, dernier red smite, 2958. Canada 2314, heavy 11 for 8,000, direct airport. Canada 2314, heavy terminal, bonjour, runway 24, altimeter is uh, 2958, this is whiskey. We have whiskey, sir, 2958, uh, Canada 2340. Okay. Canada 318, descend to 7,000 and delete all the star restrictions. 7,000, no restriction on the star, uh, 310. Canada 3940, proceed right to Sildo on course, descend 8000. Descend to 8000 and uh, direct to Sildo on voice 3940. Canada 2314, fly heading 060, vectors to funnel, descent to 6000. 060, Worldwide 61, 1000, climbing 5000. Uh, worldwide 61, Montreal departure, identify, climb flight level 230. Identify 230, Worldwide 61. Envoy 3940, descent to 6000. 7 out of 4000 descending. Looking for traffic, uh, 318. Okay, at 2310, you got company uh, C Series on your left side in 6 miles coming towards you, out of 8000 feet, descending 1000 feet above you. Yeah, 2310, okay, thanks. We're looking. Canada 61, proceed direct Fawns on course. Direct Fawns on course, Worldwide 61. Hello, hello, hello everyone. How's everybody doing? Welcome to this uh, first in its history of Virtual Air Canada live stream. Uh, live for the very first time on our new Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash VAC Live. Let's get this show on the road very shortly. Hope the noise and the volume's alright for everyone. If you guys want to let me know in the chat, 
if the uh, first of all the microphone's good and uh, second of all if the sim's too loud too low same thing with uh, ATC you can let me know and um, I'll try to adjust accordingly um, this is a first for you guys this is also a first for me a uh, very first live presentation so it'll be a first for all of us hopefully uh, you guys enjoy what we have to offer here uh, this evening let's get the uh, main screen turned on here we go in the simulator and hopefully the uh, sounds will uh, be all right uh, a lot of stuff to cover today so hopefully um, you guys will stick around uh, the plan basically today will be to do just a nice little rapid air flight service um, from Montreal to Toronto uh, we'll be flying Air Canada 425 and uh, we'll be going through um, twofold basically the first fold will be just covering virtual Air Canada's operation what do we do what do we simulate and how we go about it and second of all and I think this is what you guys came for, is we'll try to do as much as possible as per real world SOP. Um, obviously, we're, um, I'm an Airbus 330 a real world pilot, uh, fly out of uh, Toronto in real world, so I'll try to um, integrate as much as the uh, Airbus philosophy as I can, try to help you guys out, understand um, how we do things and why we do things and what are things that are more important than others so we'll go through all of this together and uh, hopefully at the end of the stream you'll have a, a good understanding of um, the Airbus philosophy the operations that are Canada or virtual Air Canada I should say and uh, most of all you'll have fun learning about it so here we are we're sitting at gate uh, I believe it's 49 uh, obviously we're not gonna see it uh, in this uh, FS Labs Airbus uh, A321, and the reason I chose the A321 versus my 330 is just because I find the FS Labs is probably the closest product, um, in my opinion, obviously, um, to the real world thing. Uh, their, their si the simulation of their systems, uh, the way the integrate the A cars, CPDLC, and all of that. Um, gives me the best tools in my opinion to give you guys um, the knowledge and uh, so on to um, to be able to pass on basically that knowledge so to get it as real as it gets if I can use Microsoft's terms um, so that you guys can learn uh, obviously we are sitting in the airplane right now you wouldn't see it this way in the real world operations you'd actually have some power onto the airplane um, but then again, uh, we wanted to show you basically how to start from scratch. So therefore we're, um, we're going to start it from cold and dark. So first off, if you're new to, uh, virtual sim or simming or virtual airlines, uh, virtual or VAC is, um, basically a virtual airline that recreates, um, flights from its real counterpart when they're biggest airline in Canada. Um, we've got our website, obviously, v VAC or virtual air, www.vacanada.org, which is See, you guys, you guys got me. So go back here. I'll get you the sound in a minute. So here we go. And boom, this is magic. You guys should hear me just fine now. Uh, like I said, first stream, so things will go wrong. And you know what? When we do some flying, sometimes things go wrong as well. So it's about adapting going through your checklists and dealing with the problem and solving it. So we just solved our first problem right here. We went through the QRH, added the microphone, and you guys should hear me fine. So here we are on the website. Um, link is in the description as well. And basically, if I were to just log into the members section, you would see your rank, 
your uh, memos, which are very important to read as per um, the normal counterpart. And you can bid for your flights and also uh, build up your own schedule or have pairings built up for you by the system itself. And once you've chosen a flight, you can have access to it via your flight assignment, paperwork, and off we go. Now what I did is I've actually already loaded uh, the OFP. I've done that about an hour ago because you would there we go. You would, generally speaking, be at the airport or checking in for a flight about an hour, an hour and a half before departure time. Uh, usually bef at that time, the uh, OFP or the operational flight plan is available. And um, so we'll dive into it. Once again, if there's no sound, let me know. But you guys should be able to hear me just fine. If you guys want to confirm that. Okay, perfect. So here we go. Uh, that's the OFP right here. And that's what we're going to be working on uh, with today for our flight to Toronto. Uh, before I forget, I'll sign in to VATSIM because obviously I did not do that. And if you guys want to hear some ATC, that might be a good idea. So what are we looking at here? Go from you. Charlie Fox. Perfect. So here we go. The OFP itself is um, where you get all the information for your pre-flight, for your flight itself, and it's basically what guides you from for your mission from beginning to the end. So here we go. On, um, on this particular OFP um, that we're going to be using today, uh, there's a few things we'll look when we get when we check in for our uh, actual flight. We'll make sure that the flight number and obviously the date are the correct one. Um, that goes without saying, um, especially on, um, on on le on legs where you have multiple flights. Sometimes you'll put in the the um, depending on the system works. Sometimes you'll put in your departure and arrival um, airport, and there's 10 different, 15 different flights a day. So you want to make sure you took the proper OFB. So we're Air Canada 425 today on April 15th. This was printed at 2300 Zulu. The other thing we want to look at is the release number. Uh, when you're talking with dispatch, uh, usually you'll uh, confirm the release number and you want to make sure that you have the same release as they do. Uh, sometimes you'll get a last minute updates um, on the flight plan. They'll print out a second one, whether it's for route change, um, alternate is changed, so on. Um, the release will go from one, two, three, and so on. So you want to have the same information as dispatch does. So that's the that's the way we confirm with them. Hey, look, we've got release one, and um, we start from there. There's a few things more or less important for flight simming um, it, on the first page. The most important one is probably flight summary, which we're going to look at in a bit. Flight plan route, obviously, alternate information. And what I go through right off the bat is the planned fuel. You want to make sure that, or you, at least you want to know what's been loaded onto your airplane. So right now we can see we've got taxi, the burn. We have 800 kilos of contingency, which is about worth 15 minutes. We've got our alternate with London, Ontario, and our final reserve. So basically, I know right off the bat, before even leaving the briefing room, that we've got 15 minutes of extra gas to play with for X amount of reason. And obviously, real world, like our flight sims, if you're using real uh, weather, things do evolve. And sometimes they do evolve quite rapidly. You might have some weather rolling in. Um, that dispatch known about but didn't plan for it, et cetera, et cetera. So I always look at how much fuel I've got on board uh, before even opening up the sim, making sure I planned for everything, planned for a contingency, and so on. If you're going to cross the ocean, you want to make sure you've got some ETOPS fuel if required, things like that. And then this is probably the third most important page I'll look at, and that would be uh, the weights. So make sure that their zero fuel weight doesn't go over a max. The most importantly, landing weights. You want to make sure that 
it's been planned that you're not landing at your airport overweight. That might be an issue as well. So those are different things I would look at uh, before planning. So let's get step back into the airplane. So here we are, like I said, sitting at uh, gate 49 here in Montreal. Um, we're cold and dark. And first thing I would do is turn on the light. Now, some airplanes, the dome is on the hot bus, so it would turn automatically. In this case, it doesn't. Uh, we can see that external power is available. So we'll be able to connect directly to external power, but first we're gonna turn on the batteries. And the reason we turn on the batteries is because the system will initialize itself. And most of all, it'll have the self-protection for over voltage. So if the ground power is giving it out extra volts or so uh, whatnot, you're gonna be sure that uh, your over volt protection is um, adequate. So here we go, boom. Lights on, camera in action, external power is on, and now we can see that things are starting to come alive in this beautiful Airbus 321. Before we start on with our flows, we'll just make sure that we've got everything set up. So we are connected to the VATSIM network, so this is going to be a live flight if you guys want to follow along. Um, are we showing on there? Yes, we are. Perfect. So the self-test will do itself um, on the screens. Like I said, when you get to the airplane on a normal line flight, uh, even if it's the first flight of the day, it's very rare that you'll end up doing a cold and dark scenario. Um, you'll always find yourself with the external power usually connected on. And the reason for, for that is because either the airplane was sitting there overnight and maintenance came to do a quick check, made sure everything was working well, turned on the power, they'll just leave it on. Um, and if not, it was towed in by a tow crew and they would leave it as well in a uh, powered on configuration. So the only time the airplane's really turned off and everything's cold and dark, it's when it's parked off stand somewhere, uh, either at the base or in um, in an off-field airport, or airport parking, sorry. Uh, but other than that, sitting at the gate, you'd, you'd come in and it would basically just look like this. So batteries are on, would be sometimes off if the external power is already connected. You can turn the batteries off, the external power will still be on. The reason you, you would turn the batteries off is to make sure that they don't overcharge and then get a get an overheat or a, a surcharge on it. Um, other than that, you come in, turn on the batteries, and here it is. And um, that's how you would find the, air, the, the airplane itself. You'd so from there, you've got your paperwork, you take in your seat, and you've briefed your, um, your colleague, obviously. Uh, you went through the OFP together, make sure you're on the same page, uh, made sure that one or the other, if we had questions or concerns, those have been raised up, um, communicate with dispatch, make sure that they, um, that they would um, be aware. So first question, so this is the state you'd find the airplane. So external power and batteries. So yeah, basically you would, external power would be on, batteries would be off. APU would be off as well. Um, that's the way you would find the airplane in, I'd say 90, 95% of the time. Um, sometimes if maintenance has been doing some work on it or the airplane has just been towed in, then the external power might not be off, but then the APU would be running. But if you're, you're coming in first flight of the day, you're looking at batteries off, external power on, and everything else just turned off. Um, and that would be its basic uh, basic start, basically, basic format. So from there, I'm coming in, sitting down. Obviously, I would come in. It's You're not flying an Airbus if you're not using the tray. So put my stuff on the tray and and start work, start getting to work. Um, there's there's three types of I'd say checklists or procedures. There's um, flows associated with checklists, 
which are uh, memory and do. There's read and do, and then there's just read. So there's a, those are the three types of checklists and um, items you would find on a normal SOP. Uh, for this cockpit setup itself, at uh, my operator, what we do is we it's actually done it via the QRH. So we've got a flight pre-flight um, setup and we just follow along each and every single point in the um, QRH itself. So if we were to do that, um, and I'm just going to do it by memory here, but I would have the QRH set up on my on my tray table, is we would start, and we don't we start with the overhead panel. So we'll make sure that the crew supply um, would be on, so all dark. Ground control, which is basically for the uh, voice recorder is on so that the voice recorder actually records what me and my colleague are saying and briefing and whatnot before the engines are actually started. And you, Airbus has a very um, easy concept to understand. If you take a look at the overhead panel itself, and if you're wondering how I'm moving about uh, with this within the simulator, I'm using a program called Chase Plane. Um, I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with it, uh, which I appreciate and love uh, greatly. But to come back to what I was saying, um, Airbus has the what we call a dark cockpit philosophy, meaning that in a normal state, the switches are all dark. So that when something is out of the ordinary or wrong, you get a light and that catches your attention. So it's a very simple concept. And it's a concept that we follow for um, our pre-flight. Basically, we want to make sure that the switches are black. And if they're not black, why aren't they black? So if I were to go for ground control, it's auto. GPWS, well, the reason there's a fault in it is because the airplane doesn't know where we are. So we can't give you any feedback because it doesn't know where we are since our navigation system is off basically. So what we do is we start down and we work our way up. So flight controls, everything's dark, perfect. Eight years. Now something that's very important with the eight years and the ADRs and the IRs and whatnot is um, this is your main way of navigation. Um, obviously there's the IRS that uh, we will align in a minute. There's also GPS that is involved with uh, navigation for the Airbus, but all of this is linked through the ADRS panel. And you can see it's it's quite funny the way it's it's written. It's IR1, IR3, and IR2. What you want to make sure and you want to get in a very good habit of is always switching on or off one, two, and then three. It's very simple to be to wanting to go from left to right. But it's a bad habit because and here if you do ever have to switch an IR and ADRs or so on off in flight and you'd have to have it from go from going from left to right if you wanted to example shut down the um, nav selector of number two your tendency would be to go for this one instead of this one so what you want to do is you want to go one two and then three Do you prefer the stick over the yoke? Why? Why not? Good question. Um, when I first started flying the Airbus, I hated the stick. I transitioned from a uh, turboprop where um, I, that I've flown for quite a bit of time. Um, got used to flying that plane, loved it. And then I transitioned from a yoke to a side stick. Hated the side stick. Um, it got a bit of time to get used to, um, not only throughout um, my initial simulator phase, but um, through some line and dock. But now, I just love it so much um, that it, it'd be hard going back to a yoke, honestly. Um, Airbus and Boeing, obviously, are two different philosophies, two different ways of flying. but. Having the, the yoke on the side for me now is has become first of all second nature. I and it's basically just plug and play. You just point um, 
you just point on where the airplane wants to go and it goes there for you so um that's uh i find that it, it takes time to get used to but once you get it it's it's so much um i find easier to fly with and yeah um uh, minus seven i don't want to I don't want to massacre your name there, but you're right. It's more ergonomical. You get the uh, you get the nice little tray table right here. Um, you can have a nice meal. You don't need it to have it on your lap. It's great. Um, you can move around. It's fantastic. And no, you do not need to wait for the on bat or um, the on bat to go. You just flicker. These things will cycle, and you're off to go. And you can have these batteries off. That's not that's not a problem at all. So if we were to continue, so we did the ADR side of things. What we would do is we come down here, uh, make sure the um, make sure the um, emergency lights are at arm. Um, sometimes they might not be, so arm. The seat belts would definitely be off, so I missed that one. Uh, make sure that they're in auto. Lights. So strobes are always in auto position, and until we line up on the runway and we'll put them on. Um, but we'll leave them in auto instead of off. In case we do forget to put the strobes on, um, the auto feature would kick in and kind of save our butt. Everything else would be off. And the nav and logo light, you've got off one and two. And depending on which pilot is pilot flying, so either the captain or the first officer, uh, you would switch the position. So position one would be um, would be the captain. and. If the f first officer would fly, we'd just flicker that to um, nav two. So, what is your favorite part about being a pilot, and what do you recommend to a youngster? I would imagine want to be pilot to success in the aviation career. Um, I'll start with the recommendation. Recommendation would be um, perseverance. Aviation is a very um, hard industry. You get some very good times, like we've had over the last decade. So from, I'd say, 2010 to 2020, aviation has been booming. Companies have been doing great. Um, but it's always up and down. And when it's down, it's a very hard industry to be in. So put on your hours. Um, be ready to... Might ha You might have to move, get some sacrifice, uh, sacrifice your... Um, your lifestyle sometimes, having to go fly up north in a, for small operators, things like that. Um, and um, <laughs> sorry, last question there just got to me. I'll answer that in a minute. Um, but perseverance is probably the first and foremost. Uh, never give up on your dream. Uh, I always wanted to be a pilot. I was. I knew it at the age of five, and um, it was hard work. Um, when I gra I graduated in 2010. Where the industry just started to pick up again. I my first paid flying job was about a year and a half later as an instructor. So not only did I do my, not only did I have to do all my flight school training and college and whatnot. I actually went to get my instructor rating and had to teach. I taught for about two and a half years before I moved on, which is I you know what I loved those two years or two and a half I should say. Uh, it was great. Um, some other people had to work on ramps, um, load bags, and start their career there. Other people went way up north at minus 50. So there's different paths to get to um, an airline, but perseverance is probably what you need. So, do you like omelets too, or is it just an RJ thing? It's just an RJ thing because um, if you know me well, you'll know that I was uh, previously flying a Dash 8, and we did not have ovens in the Dash 8, so it's an RJ thing. Uh, did you start at Jazz? If so, were the hotels you were sent to sketchy? I heard regional pilots telling me the re uh, that as a regional pilot, you get into a habit of checking checking for bed bugs. I don't know if he's trying to mess with me. Um, I did not start my career at Jazz. I did, um, like I said, I did. I was an instructor. Then I flew uh, cargo for a bit before moving on to um, Jazz. Um, as for the hotels, I think bed bugs are just part of the, or just can just be part of the 
hotel industry in general. You can be in a five-star hotel, and unfortunately, the person that was right before you contaminated the bed, hasn't been switched off properly, and you could get bed bugs. Uh, yeah, bed bugs. So it's it's not really um, it's not really uh, a regional thing. I think it's just a hotel thing in in general. Um, Dash 8, 100, 300, yes, I was on the Classic. I didn't fly the Cucumber. So, um, the good old Classic from the late 1980s, early 1990s uh, with the dials. We had some EFIS, so that was great as well. Uh, so, here we go. We'll continue on. So, as we said, um, Cole, uh, we said uh, the dark panel concept. So any ice, everything looks good. Cabin pressure. We want to make sure that this little knob right here is in auto. And that means that the cabin pressure is going to be in the auto um, system for uh, our flight. Here's our uh, air and air conditioning. Uh, I'm always cold in flight. So I like to turn these to about 24 degrees. 24 degrees is a good, um, is a good temperature for the cabin and for the um, the flight deck. Now, flight deck, you're only two or three pilots, depending. So you guys can talk to each other if one's too warm, one's too cold, which is usually the case because the guy who's sitting in the sun is always too warm, and the other guy's freezing. But at 24 degrees is probably a good um, a good um, setting to go for. And a reminder as well, forward and ca forward cabin and aft cabin, all you're basically moving is a window because the uh, flight attendant or the in charge has a what we call a FAP or a flight attendant panel and she can adjust the, um, the, um, the temperature accordingly within the window you're setting, which is approximately two degrees north and south of the weather, of the, um, of the setting you put. Batteries, we'll turn those on and what usually is recommended is when you turn the batteries on, if we go to the ELAC page, you'll see that you've got arrows on DC bat right here and what that means is those arrows means that momentarily the batteries were charging. So right here we can see that battery 1 is charging a little bit at 3 amps while battery 2 is full at 28 volts. So that one should be close to being charged if not already it's showing 29 volts there you go so there you go you just want to make sure that every time you turn it off and on the system will just you try to charge the battery make sure it's at 100 percent okay so what's your favorite flight to operate and why um good question again um i'd say anything that's Europe bound is fun uh just because uh you get to work with Oceanic, um, it's a lot harder on your system, but those are fun, and usually Europe layovers are, are great. Uh, what's the AC interview process like? Um, I can't speak for Air Canada uh, because obviously I'm not there, but um, I can speak for um, feeders for that company, and um, it's any airline is basically the same process. You've got um, your online application followed up by usually a phone interview followed up by an in-person interview and then some airlines will have some personality exams medicals as well to do most airlines will have a medical and um, you might have a sim eval uh, to, to do and then from there it's all in human resources hands and whether you get your call or not so that's um, that's uh, that's pretty much the process, whether it's at AC, TS, or wherever you're, you're, you're going. Okay, let's move on. So, the electric panel is perfect. Uh, the fuel pumps, fuel pumps, even though we're not fueled, we can turn them on. That's not an issue. Make sure everything else here is uh, excellent. Uh, we're going to treat this as first flight of the day, so we make sure that the APU would uh, fire would uh, be checked out so we make sure that the fire turns on the squid uh, light comes on distinguish and if we were to check you want to make sure that the ECAM as well comes on same thing with the engines I won't do it because you get the um, you get the uh, the gist of it 
but um, you would test your fire. And that we don't only, we do it every time there's a crew change. So every time there's a crew change, we treat it as a first flight of the day, um, just because it gives you a better picture of what goes on. And then on this side, um, manual start, ventilation, everything's dark, cargo smoke, no need to test that. Um, cargo heat, everything's auto or normal. Same thing with flight controls. And then the audio panel, you want to make sure that the uh, PA is turned on. And that is just because you want to make sure that the um, voice recorder actually records the um, actually records the um, flight attendants doing their PA. So that's a requirement as well. So I thought we had to had the fuel pumps off until the airplane was refueled. That's a big negative. At least in our operations, we don't um, we don't need to wait till the airplane's refueled to put on the pumps. Um, obviously. Keep in mind, um, every operators have their own little ways of doing things. So something might be SOP in one airline, might not be in another. So you got to take things uh, with a grain of salt. But I uh, know you can turn them on just fine. And you'll notice that if we do go to the fuel page, um, we've got nothing in the center tank. So take a look at those fuel pumps. They're off. So it doesn't really matter. Um, it, you, as long as you've got fuel within those tanks, the pumps can be running um, and they won't overheat because the fuel's in there to cool them down. So that'll be, um, that'll be uh, perfect. So overhead's done. We'll come into uh, our FCU, flight control unit. Um, flight directors will be on constraints on both sides. We'll set this up to 4,900, and the reason for that is um, we know that the departure of Montreal's is runway heading to 5,000 feet. We'll look at that in a bit. We set 4,900 because we don't have our ATC clearance yet, and that's one way to remind us because pilots are, sorry to say, we are, we all, we're forgetful and sometimes we're dumb, so we'll put in a reminder, 4,900, we don't have our clearance yet. We come into the pedestal itself. Uh, we want to make sure that the radios are turned on. I'm going to put in some more integral lighting because it's getting dark. There, there we go. Um, make sure the McDo's turned on. Radios are all on. And then uh, one of those things you want to check is the air data. And what we do to check the air data is you take a look at your PFD, your primary flight display, and you take a look at the altitude. We're showing about 130 feet. We're going to go captain on air data 3. And we just want to make sure we're within the same altitude right there. So 130 feet, we'll switch back, and you'll see it'll, it'll bump just a bit. Sometimes you'll see a little change. So what's going to happen to all the 310 pilots from Transat? They're transferring to their 321 NEOs. Um, Again, like every airline, um, you've got bids that are all seniority based, and um, depending on your seniority, you can bid on uh, different type of equipment. So everybody's just going everywhere, um, just like any other airline. Like it was at uh, my previous airline, like it is now. Um, we we have bids usually twice a year, sometimes more if there's changes to the fleet and you bid on a certain position and if you're able to hold it great if not then hopefully you put you know one two three four five different options and you'll be given the option that your seniority can hold so um, to answer your question directly no not all 310 pilots are going through the 321s um, it all depends on seniority basically if some of them wanted to go in the 321 then they probably got it who knows um, there's so much movement, or there was so much movement anyways, that um, it's, it's hard to tell who went where. So here we go. Um, here we want to make sure these are at idle, engine masters are off, Eng uh, engine start selector is norm. Spoilers are retracted, flaps are in the same position as the 
indicator. That's what we're looking at. So they're not necessarily at zero. Uh, sometimes down um, in places where it's 30 degrees plus outside, you would want to leave some flaps at one, just to make sure that those slats are down, giving some extra cooling to a uh, bleed air system within the wing. But um, you just want to make sure that the flap lever position and the flap position in, or the flap, yeah, the flap uh, position indicator match. That's all you're, you want to make sure there. Uh, we're going to make sure that this MegDo is now turned on. Uh, it should come up here very shortly. There we go. And again, same thing here. Make sure the radios are at work. And we go down to our TCAS and transponder. Standby altitude reports. Number one, captain's flying. Number two, first officer's flying. That's the general rule of thumb. And we're going to put uh, in a 000, zero zero for now. You might have understood high temp areas. You would leave uh, flaps extended after shutdown for cooling. Yes, we would leave it at position one plus F. Um, that's a three thirty um, thing. I cannot confirm if that applies to the three twenty family, but I do know uh, for the three thirty you know, in temperatures where the outside air temperature is thirty plus. Then yes, we would leave them at one plus F. Therefore, you would have um, the bleed air tubes that are running in the um, in the um, wingtip or uh, on the slats themselves, it would cool uh, much faster. So if you did use like win uh, wing NTIs and whatnot, it would um, it would cool a little bit faster, and you avoid bleed air uh, over temps. So that's basically your uh, cockpit setup, and now we'll be uh, ready to start working uh, with uh, the MegDo. And um, how's how's the sound? Like I'm not too sure how the um, sound for uh, the sim is compared to myself. Is that all right? You guys, let me know. Five by five sounds good. So the sim's not too too um, high, low. Here, let's get some ATC going. So we were saying that Montreal Tower was in here. Uh, tower is 19.9, so let's get that up. We'll get them going. If they're too loud, then let me know. We'll turn that down as I talk. Perfect. So you guys are telling me it's very good. Excellent. Love your feedback. Um, as I said, it's a first for you guys, but it's also a first for me. So let's go on. So in the McDo here, um, in the airplane itself, you would have exactly the same. You wouldn't have the, the left-hand side, obviously, for normal reasons. Montreal 10 Air, Air Canada, Port 7, ready for the push. There goes ATC. Is that Canada, too loud? 427 Tower, uh, push back and start as a crew face to the east. Face to the east, Air Canada, 427. So you're telling me the ATC is good? ATC is slightly loud, but not bad. Okay, so you know what? We're just going to bring that right down to here. And you know what? Worst case scenario, once I s actually start to be quiet and start flying, we might bring it a little bit back. So let's do that. Uh, so what are you guys saying here? You're making fun of me, probably, with reason, obviously. Uh, so very good, very good. Um, okay, hot weather check on ground. Hot weather may cause overheating and detected. Okay, perfect. ATC might be too loud. ATC just a bit touched, a bit loud. Thanks. Excellent. Okay, so I did turn it down. You guys let me know um, if it's too low once we get going, and I can crank it back to um, a higher level. So. Being in the airplane, you get the MegDo menu. You would have the FMGC, obviously, the AIDS, CFDS, Control the ATSU. You wouldn't have uh, the panel state or not. Is that looking good or yeah, a little too loud still? Yeah, 0983, taxi to runway 24 left via Alpha Mike, Alpha, cross 28, call me back short 24 left. Way better. Okay. Very good. Excellent. So I might Together talk a bit one, over um, via, Montreal Tower. I hope you'll bike, forgive me about that. Just a tiny bit loud. Oh, okay. Nine, eight, you know what? Three. Let's bring it down to about here. Same level as my sim. And then we'll we'll tinker a bit a bit more. So FMGC. 
that's the first thing we would load and what you want to take a look at this is what we call the data and aircraft status page so once you click on FMGC for the first time it brings this up you've got the engine type most important and the thing you want to check the most is the active nav database so Airbus um, a lot of airplanes but all oh, Airbus themselves have two database usually you've got an older or the upcoming version in second and you should have the current active um, database in the active position um, sometimes um, when you've got the newer one in the second nav database uh, some airplanes will do the switch automatically some won't so if you're in those changeover periods you might have to do it yourself so that's one thing we check um, some airplanes would have to uh, change sometimes the idle and performance uh, for that particular fin um, but that is not simulated here today next thing we would do is we would do the um, the init and what I'm doing is here, I'm going to write the acronym down for you guys. It's called DIFRIPS. And that's the way I learned it. DIFF, if I can spell it. Here. DIFRIPS. And that's what I follow for doing my uh, make do. So you're sure that you're not going to miss anything. Diffrips. So diffrips would be data, active stat, aircraft status. You make sure that works. The first I in, is the init, and this is where our OFP that I was talking to you about earlier would come in. Um, you went over your OFP um, in here we go in um, the crew room. You guys are both familiar with what's um, what's on it, particular things, maybe some MEL'd items, which we currently have none. Um, so you went through it um, and made sure that everything was as per uh, norm. Something that people tend to forget on flight sim anyways um, are the no tams. And depending on ATC, some might call you out on it, some might not. but on a day like today we're flying into Montreal. Montreal has some particular things that we have to check out for. A bunch of taxiways have lights unserviceable. Some are closed as well. And uh, most of all if we check into runway we've got runway 06 left and 24 right is closed. So if you really want to look professional one thing to do is take a particular closely look to your NOTAMs. Um, what I would suggest is, you know, if you're not very uh, familiar with NOTAMs, um, we could go through it in a, in a later date, but always at least check runway NOTAMs and um, approach procedure NOTAMs to make sure that you're not going to land on something or you're not planning on landing on something that might be closed. And ATC on, on VATSIM will love you for it. So we know that runway 24 right, 06 left is closed out of Montreal. So we're not going to plan for that. So we're going to go back to our first page and we're going to go into planning summary. And in there, we're going to get all the information required to uh, fill in our init page. So we'll go back to the simulator. We're back in our MacDo. And I don't know, do you guys prefer this view or would you guys prefer? Oh, that's not loading. Let's see. Would you prefer this view right? Uh, why is that not loading? Obviously. Let's see. Standby one. There we go. Jet zero one eight. Are you able to meet the departure? No, nope, still not working uh, for some reason. Roger. Thanks. Now let's see. Uh, Still not working, eh? 3D views are just fine. Okay, so we'll go back to the simulator right here. Well, in my test earlier, it did work, so I'm not sure what I did wrong. But you know what? 
I'm, I'm talking way too much, so we're gonna stick with this uh, with uh, the sim, and if by miracle I can get it to work and cruise, then we can maybe use the other view for the same. Um, all right, so here we go. I don't want to zoom in too much, or I won't be able to type. But here we go. So in it page, if uh, you've got company routes that are stored within uh, the system, if you're if your uh, make do community or in your Atsu communicates with um, via A cars to your dispatch, you can actually enter the company route. Uh, but we're going to do this the old-fashioned way. So we're going to do this. Uh, we're going from CYUL, which is the Montreal code. Toronto, obviously. And then as we fill in, company route goes to none, alternate company route goes to none. So we've got none preloaded routes. Um, depending on the aircraft type, AC either types it or has it stored. It um, it depends on the aircraft type, for your question. Um, the wind uplinks will be made by ACARS, but a lot of the guy, uh, a lot of aircrafts at uh, at uh, AC will have to be manually put in. So, uh, flight number, we're Air Canada 425. And before I forget the alternate, we said it was London, Ontario. So, I'll misclick. CYXU. Here we go. So obviously you're narrating, but how long do you usually have to get the setup before you get the plane to push on time? Um, 30 minutes with briefings and everything um, without rushing. If we're rushing, we can probably do another 30. But then you would have you would run into probably some errors, and um, so we try to, like I said, uh, check ins usually an hour and a half. Um, for crossings, we're an hour and a half um, in the crew room prior to departure. Uh, most guys are there a lot earlier. We'll meet up, and then we'll try to get the at the airplane at least an hour before departure. Start getting things done slowly. Um, you're always waiting for last minute numbers anyhow, but you want to have most of the things done within that time frame. So I'd say about 30 minutes is if I were to just do it, not say anything. Um, under 30 minutes we would have been gone. Now I know I'm talking a lot. Let me know if I talk too much. Maybe you guys are like, ah, Bruno, we know all this. You're talk you're wasting your saliva. Uh, you're wasting our time. Then I can just speed things up. But I'm hoping that I can teach you guys one or two things as we go along here. So let me know. Um, I'm all about feedback um, and uh, what to the you guys want to see. Mm. So there we go. So cost index was um, 34 and our cruise altitude was 34,000 feet. So 34 oh, flight level there. A tropopause, we, um, 20. Flight level 220, we'll enter that in there. And some airplanes will have it, some don't, depending on the um, on the FMGC uh, version. Ground temp, you want to make sure that it matches what the airplane is reading outside or for what you get from the ATIS. Uh, usually you'll put in the ATIS temperature, but you want to make sure that it's the proper temperature because all, everything is calculated, your performance wise, everything's calculated through the ground temperature right here. So, if we're continuing on from our hey, different well, yeah, acronym, uh, tropopause. So, um, the tropopause, guys, is a layer in the atmosphere. So, the, uh, it's the altitude at which the, that layer is located, and most of the weather within or around the um, the atmosphere within the atmosphere is located within the tropopause. So we enter the altitude of that tropopause just for that the performance sake of the MEGDU. So it'll calculate our um, optimal altitudes uh, with the input of the tropopause, our weights, our the winds, the temperatures in altitude, and so on. So. And it's not even, if you don't know it, it's not required at all. Um, you're still going to get some optimal altitudes from your winds and from your um, your temperature itself. And where is it located on the OFP? Very good question. Um, let's go to our OFP. So here we go. 
if you take a look, you've got flight level, so that's our cruising altitude, and TRP trop pause, 222. So I actually put in 220, but it's 222. That is the trop pause altitude. And here, temperature deviation minus 2. That's the deviation of the temperature from the IKO standard. So this standard goes, we lose about 2 degrees per thousand feet. And the standard at sea level, or altitude zero, is 15 degrees. So as you go up, every thousand feet, you lose about uh, Bravo, two, eight, zero, five, um, two, one, two three, degrees. Where do you want and five? we are two degrees lower than the standard at flight level uh, 340. That's what it means, basically. The component here is the wind component. So we know right off the bat that we have a headwind of 59 knots. Yeah. Thank God we're paid by the hour. <laughs> so that is uh, where you find the information. Everything is in, f in planning summary. So, um, and mo I mean, a lot of uh, OFPs around the world are different, but are very similar. You'll, all, you'll find usually um, your init information within uh, the same block of your OFP. So everything is usually condensed. Um, even if the format changes, the information is usually somewhere um, around the same place. Uh, but on the area, on our VAC OFP, that's where you would see it at Tropopause 222. So for the sake of being uh, on the ball and you know, being a good pilot, I'm going to put 222. We've corrected that 1,500 feet. So my trip for my flight is 542. Yes, that's normal. If you're um, flying around the equator, the tropopause goes a lot higher. And the reason for that is because air is um, hot. And what does hot air do? It rises. Um, if you're close to the poles, it's going to be much lower. Uh, tropopause varies greatly due to air masses, air temperature, and location around the Earth. Um, obviously the temperature or the average temperature around the equator and around the poles are a lot different. So you could expect in a normal standard scenario that your tropopause would be a lot higher where the hot air is, so the equator, and a lot lower in the northern uh, part of the atmosphere. So around the poles, north and south, obviously. So flight plan, um, this could be very quick. Montreal, that's where we're off departure and um, on our flight plan departure runway was 24 left usually Montreal dispatch is very good uh, at looking at what nine, four, um, runways nine. are in use and what Good runways you can expect and looking at, uh, met, at METARs and TAFs and so on to figure out what you're going to be doing. So and you want to cross-check that with the current uh, ATIS, but usually 95-99% of the time the dispatchers will put the proper departure and arrival runway you can expect. Um, obviously these guys are planning 20-30 you know, flights a day um, and they know as much as you know at the airports you're flying into, or at least they're supposed to. So runway 24 left there's only one sit out of Montreal, so Montreal, Montreal one departure. One departure flight plan and route. you can insert uh, it right now. I'll, I just like to keep everything in the temporary uh, flight plan, make sure I've got everything correct, then I'll insert. So we know from our route, so if I'm going to bring you guys back to the OFP here, you can 